on this special 200th episode, Michael Keaton's possible return to Batman, Xbox says goodbye to Mixer, and hello to Facebook Gaming, and the divisiveness of The Last of Us Part 2. All this and more as we delve for the 200th time into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Hey everyone, it's Gerald Glassford from the Pop Culture Cosmos. Inside Sports Fantasy Football, the Lakers fast break and game source. If you get a chance, please give us that five-star review and also subscribe and like our podcast. If you can, we cannot thank you enough for doing so. I'm also coming up here with my fellow host, Josh Peterson. He's on deck as we talk Michael Keaton returning to the world of Batman, Cyberpunk 2077's latest impressions, the strong divide over The Last of Us Part 2, and we discuss the death of Mixer and the rise of Facebook game streaming as a possible contender to Twitch and YouTube. I want to go ahead and also give a big thank you to Octavio and Eric Gomez from Go Brothers Gaming, Chad Smith from Hyperschmidt, Jamie and Tony Monroy from Game Source. Daphne Matthew from the Walking Dead fan base. Also, DJ Plasma Z doing such a great job on one of our favorite theme songs that we've used so many times before, especially on our commercials. So we cannot thank you enough for allowing us to do that as well. All the great people at Retro City Games, Douglas and Nicole, and obviously Rob McCallum Films with Rob McCallum, Jay Bartlett, Ben Arnaud from the Smoking Hot Confessions, Knowing and Fine from Honey Queen, Jessica Box from the TV Ratings Guide. You've been so much a great part of this. Vince Atulo from the Sports Card Podcast. Marcus De La Garza has been a great part of us as well. I mean, there's so many people out there that have been a part of this. Voice from the Underground, the guys that have been fantastic. To so many people who support us for 200 episodes, and we cannot thank you enough for doing so. But getting back to what we were talking about with DCEU, I mean, how do you think this is all going to play out, man? I mean, when it comes to Michael Keaton now most likely being a part of this universe, we have the older Batman... We have the younger Batman in Matt Reeves' Batman trilogy, which is not going to be a part of this connected universe. Do you still think they could cohesively connect the universe? You know, I like to say when it comes to DC, never say never, right? Because the, the moment that the Joker came out, everyone's like, no, it's just going to be standalone. He's just going to be doing his own thing. And then, you know, that movie was just a, a smashing success, right? And then the Matt Reeves Batman came along and everyone's saying... Well, maybe we don't have to put Joaquin Phoenix into the DCU, but uh, it might work well with Robert Pattinson's Batman. So never say never, you know, and if if that ends up being good good enough, they might uh, very well have him, you know, somehow be incorporated into the DCU. So this right here, the flashpoint, you know, is is a great. So let's look at this, right? Marvel has over the years dabbled in the multiverse right they've kind of done you know we have our secret war secret invasion you know the the whole thing with the ultimate universe and all that and it all came to an end recently right and that's what put miles morales into the main marvel universe uh dc on the other hand has made it known for a long time that they are dealing in multiverses like it is perfectly normal to have all these heroes uh you know exist in their own universes doing their own thing fighting their own villains you know, they've actually made big event comics out of this, like uh, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths or Infinite Crisis, whatever you want to do. I remember when they, they reset the numbers and they, they have like the brand new Batman or the, the what is it, the the Batman who laughs, right? Where it's, I think it's Joker who is who becomes Batman. They have dabbled in the multiverse since the beginning. So what the Flashpoint offers you is a great opportunity to kind of all the things that they've done wrong thus far to reset those things. and. I am hopeful that they are going to, you know, make the right moves with this. But yeah, I would love to see, you know, I don't want to see the Justice League brought to an end. I would, I want to see more in the main, like DCU, and that, I'm hoping that Flashpoint will provide that opportunity. I mean, after the lukewarm effects of Avengers: Age of Ultron, did Marvel call it in? Did they call it a day? I mean, because Age of Ultron is, I don't want to say it's been forgotten about, but it's kind of been forgotten about, and it's not very well thought of in the overall pantheon of Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. So I think that they should not just give up on the this Justice League concept. 
it's something that they shouldn't give up, Josh. It's something that they shouldn't give up hope on after one film didn't do quite what they wanted it to do. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm I'm looking at this from the perspective of Incredible Hulk, right? Like the Incredible Hulk came out, it was okay. People thought it was okay. Not everybody hated. It. A lot of people did hate it, but it, it it's just it wasn't it wasn't Iron Man, you know. And they kind of just said, okay, well, that's just going to be a bump in the road. We're going to keep on moving forward, and that's what they did, you know. And Avengers: Age of Ultron, well, not an awful movie. It did not have the reception that they hoped for they just kept kept moving you know and like dc they they the thing that they really need to be careful with this is they really only get one shot at this one shot to reset you know and that's because the flashpoint you can't just go back hey let's do a flashpoint too you know they need to have have all the pieces in place that they that they want moving forward because this is kind of their one opportunity to correct what they've done so far And, um, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to recast Batman should Ben Affleck not want to do it anymore. Want to give a big shout out to Jessica Box, who's watching us on the TVRatingsGuide.com, my daughter as well, and so many people around the world on so many different pages out there. Cannot thank you enough for joining us on the 200th episode. And we've got a special guest. I know he's going to be on for just a few minutes because I know he's got to record his own show. But Jason Dutch from Voice in the Underground, glad to have you aboard, my friend. Celebrate good times. Come on. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Thanks well, thank for having you. me. Oh, thank Thanks you. for having me jump in here. I don't know why on earth you wanted me, but here I be. Uh, well, we truly appreciate you jumping in with us. Quick question to ask you. What are your thoughts on Michael Keaton jumping back into yeah. the DC Universe? Yeah, you know what? Actually, I saw that. Um, I've been so inundated with talking about, you know, social issues the last three weeks that it's almost amazing. And I should say, usually not pleasant conversations when I have that, but I, I, I did actually see that. And I posted that it actually came out. There was also a story about, I guess, Tobey Maguire possibly going back and doing and being Spider-Man again as well, like a couple days before that. So both those two stories on the heels of each other was kind of cool. Michael Keaton was sort of a cheesy-ish Batman. I mean, that, those, those movies were, were sort of caricatures of, of themselves, of, of the character in a way. I don't think usually that type of Batman would fit into a larger, you know, superhero team type of, of film format. You know, I'm not sure that he would go great with like a Justice League. But I, I do think it's great going to such lengths to do this. In fact, they even said the other day that Ryan Reynolds is going to be in the Snyder Cut of Justice League. So, you know, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. You know, there's so much bad comic book news, you know, fake news. This is fake news going around these days, but I think, you know, it, it's awesome what DC is doing because they're way behind. You know, let's not let's not uh pretend beat around the bush. Let's call a spade a spade. They're way freaking behind and they've had some content issues and they've had some quality issues with the DC EU and as well as with the, you know, the cheesiness of like the Arrowverse outside of maybe the show Arrow, the rest of those shows are kind of goofy and campy. So I think the Keaton thing is, is going to be really, really cool. I think it'll be nice to see him portray that character. Maybe, I don't know, I'm sure if it's going to be like a Batman Beyond type of thing where he's going to be grooming new Batman or not, or be sort of like an old jaded Batman. But I mean, I love the Michael Keaton Batman movies. I, I hated Val Kilmer as, as Batman, and I hated George Clooney even more. I think that was the worst movie, the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, did you freeze, freeze. And sad that Uma Thurman was in that because she's such a talented actress. But by and large, I think it would have been a cooler fit if it was the Bale Batman. But obviously, that's not what's going to happen, and we'll take what we get. So it's it's good, again, because DC is able to be in the news. They're able to get people to tune in just to see what it is and get some streaming content. And if they can find a way to tie all this up and put it into somehow into the movies and carry some of that momentum forward. That'll be really great. Cause my biggest criticism of Marvel is that they haven't, they didn't have like, for example, I really liked daredevil and Luke cage, those series, they didn't even show up in that huge scene in infinity war, not even for like a, a second because they go so far to keep their TV from their movies. And th- this is something that J- Disney just does, you know, no matter what they don't, they don't really bring their Disney princesses from TV. Like, um, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but like they have uh, Elena of Avalor is like a Disney princess on the Disney channel. 
but she's never included in like when they did all the Disney princesses in Wreck It Ralph, right? She wasn't in that room with the rest of the princesses that were from film. Disney loves to separate film from TV. They when they did the Lion King remake, they didn't do anything with the new very popular Lion Guard show. You know, they didn't tie in anything at all from that, which a lot of fans would have loved to have seen. And that's just not Disney's MO. So to see that Warner and DC is doing that. Uh, for me, I love that stuff being tied together, and I think it's really, really great. They'll not only tie it in on TV, but then tie it in on film as well, That because that's the next step. It's easy to tie stuff in on TV, but if you can get tied it in on film in some cool way where, like, in, you know, I don't know what they would do, but if you, you know, and maybe, like, uh, an end scene of Aquaman 2 or something like that, you would you'd get some flashback to, like, um, you know, a, a Christian Bale Batman or something like that. For me, that would be really cool. I, I thought they, I'm sorry to ramble here, but I only have a few minutes. I, I thought they missed a huge opportunity to do that in Suicide Squad because if you if you remember the Flash in Justice League, Ezra Miller said, I only push people and run away, right? But in Suicide Squad, he came in and he apprehended Cap, Captain Boomerang in the beginning of the movie. So I was like, that should have been like the Grant Gustin Flash that did that came in and did that scene there or from the original flash TV show of the nineties that they've now tied into, you know, had it be some actual flash who knew what crime fighting was about that came in and did that or Oliver queen or something of that nature, you know, the, the character arrow, somebody else other than the Ezra Miller character, not because I had anything against Ezra Miller, but because then they went later and they said, Oh, I don't really fight people. So, you know, it's, I think they've missed opportunities too. So I'm really excited about the Keaton thing because it's just one more step that DC is doing to to tie everything together and make content that fans are going to, you know, love. Hopefully it's good quality though, too, because like I said, they're still way behind the MCU for sure. I know, Josh, you wanted to say something because you agreed with Jason Dutch on uh, the Christian Bale appearance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like what Jason's saying, too, because it kind of makes all the old movies feel like they're worth watching again. You know, like you can go, like I said earlier, a lot of people are like, well, why am I going to waste time watching the Tim Burton or Schumacher Batmans? They have nothing to do with what's going on now. Now people have a reason to go back and watch these old movies. Some of them are actually pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Again, for all the great stuff that you can go ahead and hear more of, including pop culture, social issues and everything else. Jason, where do they need to turn to? If you actually are silly enough to tune in, Voice Me Underground, we position ourselves, our little phrase is where politics and pop culture collide. So we'll talk about socio-political issues. You know, right now we're talking a lot about, obviously, like the Black Lives Matter movement, coronavirus, that sort of thing, as it plays into the political sphere. You know, we'll be interviewing some congressional candidates. Tonight we're going to talk about who Biden should pick for his VP. But we'll take all that stuff and we'll smash it together, juxtapose it, as you may say, with pop culture, stuff like comic books or sports. You know, a lot of times in sports, there's a lot of political issues like, you know, there's a huge issue right now going on with Levi Stadium going to be flying the Black Lives Matter flag as well as NASCAR removing the Confederate flag. Those are sports stories. And we'll talk about those as well, but we'll talk about them in, the, in a, in a social political context. But we love comic books. We're all, all three of us are big, huge nerds. TJ, probably the biggest comic book nerd that we have. He's like, he knows everything about DC. I'm a huge DC guy. So we'll talk about DC and Marvel, Game of Thrones, stuff like that all the time, Walking Dead, all the typical stuff that people love to watch. And then hear a political viewpoint or a counter viewpoint of like, we have a lot of conservatives that come on the show that don't necessarily agree with us on a lot of stuff, but we'll talk to them in a fruitful civil discourse sort of way and try to tackle some of these issues while having fun while doing it. Like I said, talking about sports, religion, and Haas does a cigar review every week of a different cigar. So we're a horrible show, and uh, you should definitely not tune in. Okay, then once again, the show that you should tune into is Voice from the Underground, the podcast. You want to be a part of it today by listening it to wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Chad from Ghost Toasters, and you're listening to Pop Culture Cosmos Podcast. For the latest news and information, analysis and opinions on the Los Angeles Lakers and the NBA, check out the Lakers Fast Break Podcast today on wherever you get your podcasts. And congratulations to you guys, Gerald. I just want to say that 
over the past three years of this journey in podcasting, you know, we have come across and we've been very fortunate for a small show in Voice from the Underground to come across some some great allies, you know, so for people who you would think would be your competition for ear for ear holes, it's, it's really not that way. You know, yourselves and, and Whole Sports and Jock and Nerd and just so many others that came and possibly mentioned. And you got you've been just a great friend and you put together a quality show and I I I just cannot express to you seriously how much our relationship with you means to all three of us, probably slightly more to me and TJ because we do so much content with you, but to all three of us, really, you guys have been just tremendous. And thank you so much for everything you've done for us, the platform you've given us, and when you've been there for us when we needed you podcast-wise and personally. So we love you guys, man, and, and just I hope you guys have another – eight million episodes because this show is uh, definitely one of my favorites. And, you know, I, we really, really, truly appreciate your friendship and your collaborative efforts in podcasting. Do you take Venmo or PayPal? Uh, cash app, <laughs> cash app. And remember I raised the price just before I came on. I don't know if you got that. Top. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> well, we appreciate the kind words, Josh. I yeah. Don't thanks know. man. No, no problem. Josh. I don't, you know, I'm sure you're a great guy too. <laughs> thank you thank you real quick though did you guys and i'll i'll, I'll listen to your answer as we um because i got to get off and start recording but i'll when i listen to the show i'll listen to your reply on this what are your guys thoughts about well two things actually i'd like you to very quickly touch on number one what are your thoughts about the ryan reynolds thing do you think there's any truth to that and also do you think that like the top grossing movies for 2020 is that even going to be something that they track or is it going to be like for the Oscars and like the all of the normal cinematic awards and everything? Is it going to be one of those things I think where that you have like an asterisk by it, like you know the the nineteen what was it the nineteen ninety nine Spurs or the the Blue Jays team that won the the strike shortened season? Uh, I'm not sure how those, those things are going to be looked at from a historical um, standpoint down the road. So uh, if you guys get a chance to talk about those, I'll listen. As they say on the radio, I'll, I'll hang up and listen for your answer. Well, thanks again, Jason, for being part of the show. Truly honored that you could make it on the show. And again, check out your show, Voice from the Underground, wherever it hits, right now available on all podcast outlets. And I can go ahead for me and tell you, Ryan Reynolds, you don't do what you do in Deadpool 2 and expect to go ahead and come back on. Josh, I remember distinctly in the in the closing scenes and the closing credits for Deadpool 2, him voicing his opinion on what he feels now about the Green Lantern. And it would take a lot, I think, to get him on this Zack Snyder cut. And I'm not sure that DC and Warner Brothers has that. And I'm not sure they want to spend that kind of money for Ryan Reynolds. Well, yeah, so if they did it ironically, like if he if it was a joke, you know, I'm sure Ryan Reynolds would be all over that. Like if he could somehow, uh, you know, kind of like what they did when uh, he got the script, right, to the Green Lantern in Deadpool 2, and then what did he, he shot, what, how did that end? He shot him, right? Yeah. Or he shot himself. He shot, yeah. shot himself reading the script, so happy about being part of it, had the big smile on his face, and next thing you know, you see the bullet hole through his head, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, if they did it in, like, a comedic way, like, I'm sure that that would be, he'd be all over that, but I don't know, like, how into having him join on you know return and be serious about i don't know how into that he would be but you know i hadn't heard any rumors about that until jason had mentioned it so i'm i'm curious i want to kind of do some reading up on that but yeah i'd love to talk about that again on the next show i just uh i need to know more about it because that definitely sounds intriguing to me but it just depends on how it's done comicbook.com and also as well we got this covered have said that he's possibly negotiating I haven't heard it covered by Variety, Hollywood Reporter, a comic book, and we got this covered. They like to throw a lot of stuff out there, so they're not the most reliable source. So I'm just going to say that right now. And uh, some of the stuff that does that they say out there sticks, some of it doesn't. So I'm going to say it's going to be a very hard get. And I'm also going to say it's probably going to be a very expensive get for DC. And I'm not sure that, that Warner Brothers right now, that having to spend an extra Thirty million dollars estimated to finish this Snyder cut actually wants to go ahead and spend even more money for even just a brief cameo of Ryan Reynolds. So I'm not sure that's that's going to be worth it for them. 
I definitely be interested in seeing it, but it just depends on in what capacity. I know that he hates that role above pretty much everything else he's ever done. And it just depends on how willing he'd be to go back and, and you know, try it again. Yeah. There's a lot of other Ryan Reynolds movies that may not go well with today's audiences. I mean, I was looking at Waiting and remembering Waiting uh, the other day, and I was watching some old clips from that, and I had seen that when it first came out, and that's a movie I don't think that would go over very well with audiences at this point in time. Yeah, well, let's let's be honest. You can't do anything these days that you could do probably 10 years ago. You you wouldn't be able to. Like, you... You you go on to a, a modern film and you like make a fart joke and you're gonna offend a thousand people. You know, it's just that's that's the the market these days. And it's you know, I'm surprised that Kevin Smith is able to still do what he does. But you know, he's also a really good dude and people love him. So I guess you know the, the circumstances vary. Uh, you know, even someone like Todd Phillips had said he would never make another comedy because you know that would be the end of his career. So it's it it all depends. You know, waiting is is definitely a, a movie that sticks out i like waiting i think it's a funny movie van wilder is another one that he wouldn't be able to do these days like that one is almost like over the top and how gratuitous it is and it's uh you know talk of uh sexual things well that's something we're doing as we we put more and more countdowns on the popculturecosmos.com site is i have to look back a lot of this footage that we're seeing from movies that are on that list and it's funny because Jack Nicholson's characters in various films that he's done would also not fly into the, with today's audiences as well. I mean, As Good As It Gets, uh, Chinatown maybe. Uh, you know, there's some other stuff that he's done that would not be so hunky-dory with today's audiences. And you'll see that a lot of movies from the 90s and 2000s, I mean, when I reflect and I look back upon them now, a lot of the way that they were structured – would not be structured if they were go ahead and let's say they were debuted in 2020. Yeah. And I mean, everything has its time and its place, uh, you know, and I, I want to talk about this on a future show, but like, I just, I feel like there's not really anywhere to go for, there's not really anything for storytellers to do anymore. You know, there's, there's a mold. If you want your film to be successful, you have to talk about this, this, and this. And don't do this, this, and this. And that's how your film would be successful. And that kind of makes me feel like we're not going to get original stories anymore. You know, even if people are like, hey, let me make an indie film that has nothing to do with a, a franchise because we're tired of those movies. You're still going to get the same molds over and over again just because people are, are so afraid of, you know, the the audience backlash from from telling things or doing things that people might find offensive. But and in regards to Jason's second question on the prospect of box office returns, I mean, box office mojo is still going to be tracking it uh, later in the year when people start migrating back towards the theaters. We are seeing movies like Mulan, Tenet, and others getting bumped back even more. Uh, there's there's really no movies now that's coming out in the month of July of any note because they're all being bumped back to August because of what's going on with the coronavirus here in the United States. So those movies are being hurt, and there's a lot of other movies that are transitioning. Also, Disney Soul, that also, from Pixar, that also got pushed back, I believe, as well to November 20th. So there's, there's a lot of movies that are now being... That there's always going to be in a state of flux for the foreseeable future because of the fact you have the coronavirus and all that. And this brings to what Jason was talking about as far as the Academy Awards and awards and whatnot. I think streaming movies, whether or not they get on as an entity in what was the minimum I've talked about before, L.A. and New York, you have to be on those theaters by Christmas in order to qualify for the, uh, for the Academy Awards. I think you should just out. Anything that appeared on a, one of the major streaming services or on the big screen should qualify. I mean, there's been a few good films that have come out just straight to video that I think they, they need to consider when it comes to what's going on with the Academy Awards. I mean, there's several. The Five Bloods on Netflix, and there's been a, quite a few others that, that I think that should be honored and that should be considered at least for those awards before – you know, and not having to go through the the hassle of being on those New York and LA theaters by Christmas. I think this is the one year that they should throw all that out. Well, I was reading an article, and I don't know if this is true or not, and this might just be somebody speculating, but they're saying that the Academy Awards is going to push back a few months and give 
you know these movies that are coming out in november december january a chance to make their theatrical runs and i don't know how much truth there is to this again that is might just be speculation but uh, you know, that that might be one way of solving that problem. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend, it is something to think about as we go ahead with more films that are going straight to home video. They're going to the, the outlets, the streaming outlets. So we'll wait and see how that lines up. But again, with the DC Universe now at a, it's kind of at a tipping point where or not it could be a really big success going forward or whether or not it's going to be that disarray it is going to be something we're going to look at going forward. And we've got another special guest here, live from Australia. It's our good friend from Smoking Hot Confessions, Ben Arnaud. And Ben, just cannot thank you enough for joining us real quick. We're just so happy to have you here, my friend. Mate, thank you for inviting me on. It's a very special episode for you guys today, and I appreciate you uh, having me be a part of it. And by the way, how do you like Gold Coast in winter? My gosh, it's so, so nice out there. It looks so nice. Yeah, that's a great winter for you. It looks like much better than mine right now on 110 degrees. I don't know how you're doing, Josh, oh, out wow. there in Texas. It's moist in the air, and it's hot. So, yeah, not not as good as what, what Ben's got going on behind him. You've got the nice, clear, <laughs> sunny skies, and we've got the dust storm going through the lower half of the United States. Yeah, how how nice that is. Oh, wow. But I wanted ah. to ask you real quick, my friend, your thoughts on Michael Keaton coming back to the DC Universe. Love it. Best thing I've heard in so long. I remember being 10 years old and going to watch that uh, movie in the cinema and just being absolutely blown away because I'd, I'd been a huge Batman fan my whole life. My mum actually has photos of me about four years old dressed up in, uh, in Batman costumes and all that sort of stuff. So... Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely stoked, and from what I've read about how they're going to use him to tie together, use him as a Nick Fury-type character, um, I think that's absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait to see it. I'm thrilled. You and I both, and I know Josh is excited as well for it, and it's just an incredible ride to see, hopefully on the way for those fans of the DC Universe. And, you know, I cannot thank you enough again for being part of the show, my friend. I know you can't stay on long. But before you head on out, you got to tell people why the Smoking Hot Confessions is the best experience out there for, you know, not only great grilled foods, but, you know, the experiences, the whole grilling barbecues. Tell people why the Smoking Hot Confessions is the place to go for all of that. Well, Smoking Hot Confessions is the one-stop shop for everything that you need barbecue. So we've got, as you said, we've got the recipes, we've got how-tos, we've got the product reviews. We've got um, a podcast, which in the last couple of weeks has added video to it. So now it's a, it's a vodcast as well. We interview experts from around Australia and, uh, and the rest of the world in the, in the industry of barbecue. Industry recognized and awarded for the different videos and podcasts and writing that we do. And we just live, eat and breathe barbecue. We just love all of it. Well, I'll tell you what, if you want to go and find a great place, not only for great food ideas, but great grilling ideas, you've got a lot of contacts within the industry, not only on recipes, tips, but also the equipment, which is just as important. And people seem to forget about that. The equipment that makes it all happen, the place to go is Smoking Hot Confessions, the whole experience, smokinghotconfessions.com. His great podcast, which you can hear on podcast outlets everywhere. His great site on Facebook. The whole experience, you can catch it on YouTube. Everywhere you go, it is Smoking Hot Confessions. Ben, I know I'm going to be talking to you here in the near future about more pop culture, which you love just as much as Josh and I do. I cannot thank you enough for being part of 200 episodes. But man, I've got to make sure I have my appetite ready because when you come back on, you're going to be telling us some more great grilling ideas before you head on out. Absolutely, I will, mate. I've already got a few ideas lined up and ready to torment you with. And I just want to just uh, quickly just say congratulations to the two of you for 200 episodes, putting on a great show. I listen to it every week, and uh, I, I just love all the stuff that you guys are into, all the pop culture stuff, the DC, the Marvel, the computer games, all of it. Fantastic work. Congratulations. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. And one last thing before we head on out, what is the biggest thing you're excited for for the rest of this year in pop culture? In pop culture, Wonder Woman 1984, if that ever does come out. Black Widow, I'm hanging out to see as well, mostly because I want to see uh, David Arbor's character, Red Guardian. Yes, it's definitely going to be exciting to see. 
And of course, your friend, Baby Yoda, in The Mandalorian as well. <gasps> yes, I forgot about that. Yes. Yes, <laughs> Mandalorian season two. That sounds awesome. I'm excited. And you're going to come back on the show many more times in the near future to discuss that with us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. Again, Ben Arno from the Smoking Hot Confessions. I know your time is short with us, but I truly appreciate all the way from Australia. Beautiful area out there. I'm so envious and jealous right now. I've got dust. You've got sunshine. I don't know how that works, but you know what? We're glad to have you here as part of the Pop Culture Cosmos. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thank you so much, my friend. And I look forward to seeing you on the show as much as possible out there in Australia. And all the best to you with everything you're doing at Smoking Hot Confessions. Thanks, guys. You too. I'll catch you later on. Take care, my friend. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Don't touch that dial. Wait, do do people still use dials? Knowing and fine from Honey Queen. 200 episodes of the Pop Culture Cosmos, my friend. And I wanted to let you know that we are just so thankful that you're a part of it. Just so thankful that you've been able to give us that contribution and time. And hopeful that we can go ahead and have many more contributions from you going forward. Oh, I have a feeling you will. And... Definitely, congratulations on episode 200. Uh, whenever I reboot again, I'll probably back to episode one, but I don't know how many episodes I have. But, I mean, I remember a few years ago when I asked you to guest on a couple of things, which are great. So we, we always try to help each other out in this field. My friend, it's been great having you on our 200th episode of The Pop Culture Cosmos. All right, Josh. Well, actually, I actually want to head to a couple more things before we head on out, my friend. And that is Mixer. Mixer last week, man, this is something that you and I talked about. I think, were you there with me when I interviewed the head of Mixer at E3 when they just introduced it? I was. I remember I was behind the camera and you cannot remember his name for the life of you. I know. that's. I, I worked better <laughs> than that. I did so much better at CES. You would be proud of me. You would be proud of me. Well, I guess I don't have to remember his name at, at this point because Mixer has died a horrible death. Ninja, you know, I guess paying so much in a contract for him and paying for his exclusive rights and exclusive footage and exclusive streaming didn't help the service because Microsoft last week decided to nix the channel and go ahead and align itself with Facebook Gaming. So I want to hear your thoughts. I was hoping to get Jamie Monroy on this, but I want to hear your thoughts, my friend, on this transition a failed experiment for Microsoft. You've seen this before from Apple, Microsoft, and all the big ones that are out there. They just go ahead. They don't have much patience for it. If it's not working the way they want to, they just brush it right off. How do you think this is going to work out with Xbox now aligning itself towards Facebook gaming? I, you know, it, it has the potential to be interesting, you know, but I, I, I don't know like what... Because my first memory of Mixer, remember the first time they announced it, they said, hey, we got this new streaming service. We're going to use Mixer to run all of the live streams from E3. And what happened to all those live streams that year? Not too much. They, 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 all of them crashed at least once. And, uh, you know, that was just not, that was a very foreboding, you know, start for them. What do we say about and first now, impressions? You, yeah, you only get one. And, you know, now Microsoft is, is they shut down Mixer. They're closing down all these stores. Do you think that there's, you know, I'm, I, maybe, maybe it could be something, you know, teaming up with Facebook could be uh, something interesting. But again, like Facebook is, is so it's, has been in the news for so many controversial things lately. Like, I just, I don't know if uh, that's very good, you know, PR for Microsoft at this moment in time, especially with people like wondering, What's going on behind the scenes? Should we should we be concerned about Xbox? You know, they're closing their stores, they're shutting down Mixer. Like, what is happening? Do you personally do you think that this has caused for people to be concerned? I would think it it'd be because, like you said, the issues with Facebook and basically trying to control itself until recently, been so much pressure on Facebook. They've lost so many advertisers, and that's the thing we see with all these networks and all these streaming services. It's until you start losing the dinero before you go ahead and they see all these advertisers jumping ship from Facebook, and now Facebook wants to do something. Too little, too late almost. But I still think it's going to be something that is going to be a positive for them, and it reaches a broader audience, because I think Facebook is a large enough entity where 
people will migrate back to it. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that have said, I'm never going back to Facebook. I'm never going to Facebook again. But the, the audience for Facebook is still so large. And the things that you can do on Facebook comparative to the other social medias that are out there, you can't quite do the same things you can do on Facebook as far as like what we're doing with Facebook Live. But also as well, the interaction. I can post this on several different outlets. I can't do that with with Instagram. I can't do that necessarily with TikTok or YouTube or any of the other ones that are out there. That I, I just Facebook is a, a entity all in of itself that it would be hard to go away from 100%. I think a lot of these advertisers will eventually come back to Facebook because they see the potential of it. They see the the, the things that it has. And I think... Yeah, Xbox and, and Facebook gaming is going to take a little bit of hit in the short term because of the stigma that Facebook has right now. But I think in the long term, it's a step in the right direction because they weren't going anywhere, even with Ninja and all the other big name contracted streamers that they had on Mixer. Even with those big names, they still weren't able to make much of a dent in the streaming world compared to Twitch. And I think if anything out, out there can, it would be personally Facebook gaming because Facebook gaming on Facebook, it's just, it's so easy to watch. It's so easy to run through and scroll down, and there it is, Facebook gaming. It's just, for instance, when we go ahead and start running our D&D videos once again, or the Star Wars D&D videos, I'm going to go ahead and pop it on Facebook gaming and see if that works, see if they'll allow me to, and, and I will probably get a larger audience from it. I've tried to stream on Twitch as of late. I haven't seen very much of interaction. It's just, for me, it's a kind of, Tit for tap. I see a lot more results when you and I go ahead and talk on the 200th episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos. I've seen a lot of interaction so far, and I've seen as far as all the stuff that I've done on Facebook Live get a lot more reaction than I do on Twitch. So I think it's going to be based on the type of streamer that that makes a, a dent into it. But I think Facebook Gaming ultimately, in the long run, was a better decision for Microsoft to align itself than just saying, hey, we're going to ditch Mixer and go back to Twitch. Yeah, I mean, it also sounds like it might be mutually beneficial to both companies, right? Because Facebook had announced, um, was that? Well, Facebook gaming has been in, here a while. Facebook streaming for them has been a little while. No, it's no, just something but that I they, mean... haven't, they haven't been able to get a really nice hold of yet. Yeah, it's something that like they Facebook had announced, right, that they were looking into acquiring, you know, their own first party studios to to build games for them. And this might be a good opportunity for them because they can kind of, you know, I don't know what that future looks like, but I'm sure Microsoft has resources that they can use and vice versa. So it might be a good, uh, you know, mutually beneficial to both companies. I know they did acquire the Order 1886 developer well, Ready at Dawn. But that was right. more for the VR aspect. Um, I think that Sony still has the rights for the Order 1886. And yes, I know the game is much maligned, but I would love a sequel. Please, Sony, please, Sony, please, Sony. <laughs> love a sequel to that game because I love the lore of that game. From the lore and the world building standpoint, that yeah. game and the look was top notch. And then you well, play Order the game 18... and when it went downhill from there. Yeah, so Order 1886 kind of feels like Sony's Alan Wake, right? Like everyone loved Alan Wake and Microsoft, Remedy made it, Microsoft owned it, and then Remedy finally got the game back. And now they're like, hey, here it is. You know, this is what happened to Alan Wake and maybe there's going to be a sequel. So maybe we'll see something like that happen with, uh, you know, with the Order 1886. I bought that game uh, probably four or five months ago. Haven't had a chance to play it because I know you like it and I really want to play it. So as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to sit down and play it. I might stream it. But what I would love to see out of this whole deal is a way to cross post from Facebook onto Instagram uh, IGTV. Like I know Facebook owns Instagram, so this would be a great chance to maybe introduce Instagram to some gaming. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? That would be great. I mean, IGTV is, is hard because you got to have a certain amount of requirements to actually be able to post on IGTV, which I thought, or be post a certain limit amount. I mean, IGTV seems like this is an exclusive deal. I mean, you can post for just a short period of time on IGTV, but if you want to post longer videos, you have to get, you have to meet so many different requirements. So I would like to see IGTV evolve because I think it's something even Instagram hasn't really taken seriously. I mean, they had it there, they have it there, but like what Microsoft deals with Mixer and then Amazon is dealing now with their video games, that they're not really putting 100% into it. 
I think it's something that they Instagram have not taken seriously with IGTV. So you're right. That would be a great way to integrate more into it because the Instagram audience would love to see that. But everybody in Instagram, you think I was only going to be see things or they like pictures or they like very short videos. I think they could do something like this even more. I think IGTV is, is an unexplored region of the social media universe that they should explore and possibly Facebook gaming could be the key to it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's a lot, the younger generation, uh, kids coming up, they're on Instagram, they're not on Facebook, their parents are on Facebook, and that's not cool anymore. So they're all on, you know, Instagram, like I said, TikTok and Snapchat, whatever, whatever it is these kids are doing these days, but there's a lot of them on Instagram. So if you want to, to, you know, say, raise up the next big name in game streaming, like Instagram TV would be the perfect place to do something like that. Well, that's true, and let's, let's hope that that's the case, that, that they can utilize that platform and allow us to go ahead and start utilizing that platform a lot better. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that they will go ahead and you know, make better moves in that situation. But yeah, I think the overall move away from Mixer was a good one because Mixer wasn't going anywhere fast, anywhere soon. When you have the world's leading streamer and he's not able to go ahead and make an impressionable dent, into the streaming universe i really think that shows that you know what mixer wasn't really the way to go over twitch i think that facebook gaming can be i think that facebook gaming is is a place where easy access and visibility collide yeah i understand this is still your dad's or your granddad's or your grandma's or your mom's area for social media but i also think because of things that you can do on it because the, the there's not as much limitations as far as what you can put on there, as far as content, as far as just even typing letters, characters. You can do so much more on Facebook that you can do on virtually other any other streaming media out there or, or any other social media out there. It's just, to me, I think the possibilities are there, and I'm hoping that Facebook gaming can take advantage of them. And I hope they'll be able to go ahead and, and post our future stuff as well. Yeah, that'd be nice. I'm I'm hopeful as well. But yeah, it just it seems like there are pros and cons to this whole thing, and hopefully there'll be more pros in the end. But uh, you, you know, they were really stoked on Mixer. So how soon until the uh, you know, they get really stoked on Facebook and then cast them to the side too? So it's uh, it's yeah, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. What are your thoughts out there on? Well, first off, Michael Keaton coming back to the DC Universe. And also as well, what are your thoughts on Mixer going bye-bye and saying hello to Facebook Gaming for Xbox and Microsoft? What are your thoughts on each? It's PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Also as well, PopCultureCosmos, Humanity Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis and i want to thank again so much jason dutch from voice from the underground and all the way from australia ben arnaud from the smoking hot confessions for joining us on today's show but before we head on out my friend two last things in the video game world because we got to round this off with some good pop culture stuff and that is the last of us two divisiveness i mean we talked before on the show that it got a 96 on metacritic it's now at 95 after over 100 critics but that's still one of the highest rated games on the metacritic outlet of all time but when you look at the user ratings they're extremely low and there's a ton of videos out there that are just like lashing back at the game i'm not sure it's about the game itself i'm thinking some more about the content because of the things that are on it as far as two lesbian characters engaging in a romance plus also a transgender component within the confines of the story as well i think those are issues more and plus there's also some spoilers that i cannot go into that i'm very well aware of that i can't really go ahead and allude here because i'm going to spoil it for a lot of people but 
I think it's more about what's in the game than the game itself is the reason why it's getting a lot of uh, negative feedback from audiences. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'll tell you where I'm at personally. Like, I, I, I don't have an issue with a lot of that stuff because I've, you know, it's been in games for a long time now. It's not like there's anything new to the gaming market. But you know, I'm, I'm curious if, if this has anything to do with like all the stuff that people are being overloaded with in the news and now like there this this big game comes out and maybe people are kind of feeling feeling the weight of it but you know when are we going to get to the point where we can they you know this stuff just is it's normal you know it's not uh it's not something to like to to feel burdened by and it's you know maybe that has something to do with it i also know that there's a lot of people whose playstations are having trouble processing the actual game like it sounds like i'm i'm hearing the stories about playstation 4 sounding like helicopters or people saying there's a jet in my living room because the playstation cannot literally cannot process what's going on in the last of us part 2 and you know back to the the critic scores like i'm i know polygon I don't know what they gave it, but I know someone wrote a piece on it saying that, like, well, their review—they don't give scores anymore, but they—they they yeah. panned it. They, well, they panned it because of the fact that they uh, also because of the times. This is something I also wanted to touch on it when it comes to Last of Us Two is that because the times that we're in right now are pretty dark, the game itself is dark, and the, uh, that's another yeah. issue I think as well. Yeah, and you know that that's you know back to what you're saying about the social issue things. Like I, I'm I'm. I, I'm I'm curious if this game were to come out when the news is just not plastered every day with with social news, right? I'm I'm wondering if the reception would be better. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think it would be better if it, it was put out in a different time. I think right now a lot of people are beaten down by uh, the coronavirus, the whole nine yards, day in day out. This it's not a good time for many people. I mean, how many memes have you seen out there about their opinions on 2020 as a whole? being one of their worst years ever i mean and you bring this game out and it's certainly not meant to be uncharted in the way it uplifts you because it doesn't it's not an uplifting game i mean no, if you've ever played the first game. one and those who are playing the second one it's not meant to be an uplifting game it's a quality game it's a great game in its own right artistically but it content wise there's stuff in there or just the very mood and it, it captures it's setting off people in the wrong way just because of time. I think people are looking at it because of the time that we're in and the content that it has, and they're not evaluating as a game. They're just evaluating as an experience to them. And I, I, I'll call, of course, they're spending their 60 bucks. They have every right to do so. So I want to, I don't want to go ahead and dissuade that, but I, you know, it, it just, I, you know, if they're looking for it as far as a positive uplifting experience and enjoyable game, that they're going to go, oh, this is great, this is fun, exciting. I don't think you're going to get that. But as an, as a as a sheer quality of art, I think that that that's what you're looking for. That's what you're going to get. Yeah, I, I'm. So I I haven't played the game yet, and I'm you know it's it's on my list of games to play right now. But we have encountered games in the past, right, where they are in their storytelling, they're trying to hit every you know social dot that's currently happening in society. And like, I wonder if that's what was going on with The Last of Us Part Two. But I also know that Naughty Dog is, you know, they're really great storytellers. So I mean, I'm I'm sure it wasn't done like forcefully. I don't know. You know, it's hard for me to really like weigh in on this because I haven't played it yet. But you know, I just I can only theorize like what what that issue would be. And you know, and I was seeing the critic scores and I was seeing the user scores, and they are drastically different from each other. So that's why I was wondering about it. But I also know that like. Uh, you know, Aichi and Kotaku, GameSpot, like these are all like big proponents of social change and stuff like that. So that's like why I was, remember when we first talked about this, you were asked, you're saying like critics gave it this, this and this. And like, I've just, I wanted to know like what it was that they were, that they were cheering on. And, you know, it, it sounds like this is kind of answering some questions here. Well, they're just talking about, the, again, it's, it goes back to the time that has been released is not the greatest time for it. And it's not the most uplifting of games, I can tell you right now. So if you're looking at that type of experience for your gaming needs right now too, as an escape, it's not going to do it for you. But if you're looking at something that's sheer quality art, that is probably the, the closest you're going to get to perfection or, or as close to it, one of the best games of this generation, as this generation ends, as a quality piece of art, or uh, you know a, a standard in video game making 
you're going to look at this game as far as how much you can push the PlayStation 4 as far as overall quality of the game. Now, the content, like I said, and the atmosphere and the mood, it's not really right for 2020 at this point in time because it's a, I don't want to say it's a depressing, but it's definitely a moody game. It's definitely a game that doesn't give you many characters you're going to go ahead and and cheer for and scream for, like we talk about with Mass Effect or Uncharted or any of the other games that that we talk about. But if you're looking for a game that's a, a you know a great work of art, I think you're going to find The Last of Us too. But I just don't think it's going to be that that charmer that uh, so many people are looking for. Yeah, I mean, I I hadn't heard about. I mean, I I had heard some of it, but I hadn't heard like the whole. You know the the social stuff was that big a deal. What I had heard a lot of people saying was that it doesn't speak very good about the uh you know the tendencies of human nature. And like I can see the Last of Us to or the Last of Us universe presenting something like that that would make you see like well this game's not showing us the bright side of human nature. It's just showing us the, the depravity and like the only way you can truly save people is if they die. And you know I I totally see that dark theme bugging people but um it was like the walking dead like right now if the walking mm -hmm. dead was playing if the walking dead was playing which shows you the most evil part of it is not the the actual walking dead itself it's the humans that interact in the environment and it's not the most uplifting of of series all apologies to daphne matthew i mean but it's uh, who's another great part of the show and i thank her for her contributions as well but uh, it's it's you're if you're looking for something uplifting, you're not going to find it in The Last of Us Two. But if you're looking for a quality game, you're going to find it in The Last of Us Two. I think this is just the wrong time for it to come out. I think it should, if it came out last year, or maybe even after we find a vaccine and things start working itself up, I think people can go ahead and get into this game a lot more. Right now, it's just a bad time for it. To well, I think they meant for it to come out later, and then it leaked, right? And they kind of had no choice but to. And then they had delays and all that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure they were that that was talked about, but they kind of got put in a situation where they didn't really have a choice. I think it was supposed to be originally released in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. It's 2019, and then it was supposed to come out what in February or March, if I remember correctly. And then they said, you know, thanks because of the pandemic, we're going to be pushing this game out. And I remember it was slated to come out, you know, November where around the same time uh, cyberpunk's new release date is. And then they had the leaks and they didn't really have a choice, but to like you know, push it out sooner rather than later. Well, it is certainly divisive as far as the game is concerned. So that's the last of us too. I want to hear your thoughts out there, everyone, if you're playing through it, or if you have played it, I want to hear your thoughts on the game. Was it the, the experience you were looking for? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. My friend, before we head on out, I want to go ahead and hit up on Cyberpunk 2077 because the media got access to about three, four, five hours worth of Cyberpunk 2077. It showed the three different story arcs you can start off on as far as from a corporate or no, nomad and some of the different story arcs you can start off on before it branches out from there. Did you get a chance to see a lot of that footage? I mean, I did. I was very impressed, although I know a lot of the little kinks need to be worked out before it comes out in November, which is great that in this case that they, they are going to delay it because I think there's some little kinks that they need to work out, especially when it comes concerns the driving issue. I noticed most of the reviewers that got a chance to go ahead and take a look at it, the driving was, was not 100% okay. But the the immersion itself seems to be something that you know every one of them said was was really good about cyberpunk i haven't gotten to see the footage but you know listening to what you said it makes sense right because cd project red has you know their most of their experiences in the witcher right it's in that that universe where they're you're not driving cars there's no cities there's castles everything's spaced out so you know i can see where there would be um, Things to work out and what fascinates me though about what you said was that there are three different you know the different story arcs and you know that is something that sounds really cool because people do spend hours of their lives in these cd project red games but now it sounds like there's actually a purpose for spending extra time in these games and that really fascinates me you, you saw the footage how close does it look to something you'd see in like a, a deus ex game well, that's, I think, some of the compliments that's been tossed around is that it is close enough to the experience of Deus Ex to make it almost like a Deus Ex. So I think that's some high praise indeed 
to the original one, uh, not not the not the remake or the add-on uh, or or the sequel or anything like that. The actual original Deus Ex. So a lot of people are really digging it. That type of theme. I just love the shots of the city itself. People see the detail in the city shots and the cityscapes. That's there. All the things you can do and go into, and all the businesses and all the the daily walks of life, and it's populated with people and NPCs that you can interact with. And that I'm looking forward to when it comes to Cyberpunk 2077. It's going to have a detailed customer creator, which you and I went into. Is uh, going to customize some things that uh, I wasn't expecting or really don't care about. And you can go ahead and get an idea what you might think that would be. But I'll tell you what, my friend, that it, Cyberpunk 2077, it's got as much hype as any game that is coming out this year. And I think that right now it's on its way to to come close or to meet up with it. I don't think it's going to surpass it, but I think it's going to do a very good job of being an excellent immersive game that I think a lot of people will enjoy. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about it. It seems big. Like it seems like a really really big game and uh, you know, for that very reason, I'm hopeful that it's it is something worth spending time in. It's something you will find you can drive all over the city, find side quests, and not just like the repetitive stuff that you get in Watch Dogs, you know, like the car challenges and stuff, like legitimate character interaction that, you know, you can, that shows development. Something like what Assassin's Creed Odyssey did, but with, uh, you know, all the different side quests you do feel like they mean something. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for it as well. And if you got a chance to see the footage already on the three to five hours that was made available to these reviewers and to these media outlets, I want to, you know, I want to hear your thoughts. Both Josh and myself, we want to hear your thoughts on this footage. If you got a chance to take a look at it, what are your initial impressions of Cyberpunk 2077 as the first four hours gets released out there to take a look and see what you can do within the world? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, popculturecosmos, humanity media, and game source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. My friend, it's been a great episode. We've got a big, big week ahead, not only with the 200th episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos, but also as well, we've got several episodes of the Lakers Fast Break. Inside Sports Fantasy Football is coming back. Also as well, we've got... I think a Super BS Gamescast on the way. Brand new Super BS Gamescast is recording tomorrow, so that'll be up this week too. PopCultureCosmos.com. We're continuing our countdown of the top 100-ish movie countdown that was voted on by you, the listeners and viewers out there of the Pop Culture Cosmos. And again, if you get a chance, please five-star our show or like or subscribe. Anything you can do to support us, we truly appreciate it. And to everyone that's been a part of the show, to everyone that's watched, listened, been a part of, been a guest on, and to all the tremendous sponsors and radio stations that have also been very much a part of the Pop Culture Cosmos, to all of you, I cannot say enough thank you for being a part of it. Sincerest thank you to everybody. You know, We've had times on the show where we've wondered you know, if anyone's even listening still, and lately we've seen a huge uptick in people listening people participating the uh you know messages on facebook so thank you thank you thank you so i'll say this for the 200th time my friend any last thoughts i want to do a deep dive on the movie atlantis on another episode i know i did my spiel at the end of the episode that got lost but uh i want more time to talk about this if you're a fan of the movie atlantis a fan like i am i know some things that are going to blow your mind well i'll tell you what i will go ahead and give you that up because just as much as your show, in fact, it's just as much as everybody's show, right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. So for the 200th time, for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the Pop Culture Cosmos. Thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great 